Today, I want to talk about uh, enterprise machine learning on Kubernetes, uh, and particularly a little bit of emphasis on the enterprise bit. Uh, I, I suspect many of you have been to some of the other talks, which is just talking about machine learning in general on Kubernetes. But uh, Tim and I have been doing a lot of work at Cloudera on how do you support enterprise machine learning uh, and leveraging emerging technologies such as Kubernetes. So we want to give you some of the lessons learned from our initiatives uh, and a little bit of a peek at the road ahead. Uh, we'll try not to make this too much like a product pitch. We do need to tell you a little bit about what we're actually building so that we can talk about some of the lessons learned. Uh, but uh, yeah, with that, let me start off with introductions. Who are you talking with? So I will pass it off to Tim. So yeah, my name is Tim. Uh, recently joined Cloudera, so now I'm uh, leading technology implementation for Cloudera machine learning. We used to have a startup called Hyperpilots. So you, you see a little bit of stuff, uh, how we are uh, going to be looking to bring some of our Hyperpilot work into Cloudera. Uh, I'm not sure you've heard of our stuff before, but it's also very Kubernetes native. And I was uh, also working on Mesos and Drill and also helped work on Spark on Mesos as well. So. And my name is Tristan. I play the role of CTO for our machine learning business unit at Cloudera. Um, I was formerly the founder of a small startup called Sense, like Tim, uh, which got acquired by Cloudera about three years ago. We were building what we called an enterprise data science platform. We were using Kubernetes uh, very, very, very early on uh, and have heavily leveraged containers. And that has carried over to some of the larger scale work that we've been doing uh, at Cloudera. So let me just. I have to do this for lawyers. Some of the stuff that I'm talking about is, is, is future product related uh, and some of the things we're building. So obviously, <laughs> no promises. Uh, we're talking here as technologists, uh, not as uh, sort of uh, product people. All right, Cloudera and uh, Kubernetes. So I just want to start off by asking a question. Who here knows what Cloudera does? OK, so maybe half the people. So just to orient the rest of the folks. Uh, at Cloudera, we say we bu we're building a modern platform for machine learning and analytics optimized for the cloud. Uh, we, in particular, are focused on large customers, huge amounts of data, huge amounts of compute. Most of you, particularly being interested in open source, probably know us as the leading distributor behind Hadoop uh, and the Hadoop big data ecosystem. Uh, Cloudera and a few other vendors you know, are the key forces behind that. Um, you probably don't know us as being heavily involved in Kubernetes uh, because there's the whole Hadoop and Apache ecosystem, which has historically not been tightly connected with the whole cloud native uh, ecosystem. That is changing, uh, and some of the things that we're going to talk about today are about how these two communities really are complementing one another uh, and can deliver value to, to in, in both directions. So how are we using Kubernetes at uh, Cloudera? I want to just be clear because this is what we'll be talking about some of the lessons learned from. So the first thing is we use Kubernetes within what we call our Cloudera Data Science Workbench product. This is a product that is, gives a collaborative data science experience. Uh, it is powered by Kubernetes. It is built 100% on Docker and, and Kubernetes behind the scenes. Uh, it basically accelerates the entire life cycle of doing data science and machine learning work from exploration to production. It works on small data, so you have standalone R and Python. It works, it can connect any data source. In particularly, we have a big data platform, the, you know, the Hadoop platform, and the Data Science Workbench product is really a gateway for data scientists into that large scale uh, data engineering, scale out, compute, storage platform that uh, you know, the pe people that here know the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, that's probably what you identify it uh, with. So sits side by side with, uh, with uh, the rest of our stack. But it's really just a kind of a gateway, small, right? Couple nodes, uh, you know, gives you a little bit of a, a workbench environment for your data si science teams. So we've been shipping this. This was the, basically what I was building at Sense when we were a startup. It became Cloudera Data Science Workbench, and we've done a lot uh, around enterprise integration and security. Uh, but it's really a gateway into the Hadoop environment or the large scale sort of data uh, platform environment. So. Last week, and this is what Tim is going to be showing you some of the technology behind, about a week ago, Cloudera announced a preview for sort of the next generation, more cloud native version of our machine learning platform. So the key differentiating factor here is that we've taken the, we, we enable the end-to-end -end workflow for machine learning directly on Kubernetes, including the scale-out compute, namely distributed computing with Spark. 
So this is a product that you can install natively onto you know, EKS, AKS, GKE, you know, OpenShift, uh, has connectivity to your primary cluster, but is in a separated compute and storage environment where you have scale out compute running on Kubernetes that can include you know, your standalone R and Python, TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, but also distributed you know, frameworks that are core to the, our traditional uh, platform or the Hadoop traditional platform, namely you know, Spark is one of the most important things. So that's it on the sort of like, I'm just trying to orient you in terms of what we are building. And I wanted to tell, talk to you a little bit about some of the kind of high level lessons learned around doing machine learning uh, at scale within the enterprise, leveraging Kubernetes, uh, and then allow Tim to talk a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes, how do we actually use Kubernetes, uh, and what are the, some of the emerging uh, capabilities that exist within the open source ecosystem. So, some lessons learned. I have very limited time, so I'm just gonna give you two high-level lessons. So, the first is that within the enterprise, uh, enterprise ML really does require the bigger picture. And this is somewhat self-serving, because at Cloudera we say we you know, provide the bigger picture, but it is really true if you look at how the large companies do it. And what I mean by the bigger picture is I mean any machine learning application isn't just, for instance, running a PyTorch job or a TensorFlow job, right? It fits within a broader eco data platform ecosystem that companies have. You have data that's streaming in, you need to do large-scale data engineering, you do wanna do machine learning on that, do predict predictions and advanced analytics, but you're also driving data warehouses, right? So you're taking those predictive, pro, uh, those predictive outputs and you're driving a data warehouse that your business user could use. You have operational products that you're trying to build, right? Recommendation engines for your, for your movies or your, or your cell phone, you know, uh, something, something on your cell phone. So you need to have an operational component. And the key thing within the enterprise is how do you glue that all together? And in particular, how do you have this, a common security metadata governance story behind, behind the scenes? Now that doesn't mean you need to all go to one vendor. You can glue it together you know, by taking best of breed products. But the general point here is that you do need to fit Enterprise ML within a broader uh, ecosystem. So you don't, you, know, you might think of like, oh, it's Jupyter Notebooks. It's not Jupyter Notebooks within the, uh, the, the enterprise environment. Jupyter Notebooks are a, a great part of the ecosystem, but that's not the whole story for doing Enterprise ML at scale. So one way to, so what is required from a technology perspective? One way to look at it is look at what companies are doing and I'm sorry, I'm making sure my time is okay. So one way to do it is to look at what companies are doing. So here's Uber's, you know, had a blog post on their machine learning platform and this is their diagram that they have. And you can see it's basically the diagram that I put before, right? There's Kafka in there, for, which is part of the Hadoop ecosystem that's uh, for streaming data. There's a data lake uh, sitting there. There's a Spark job you can see that's doing data engineering, data prep job. Uh, it's leading into a batch training job, so they're doing that. Who knows, they might be using containers there. That might be a good idea. So maybe they're using containers there, I don't know, Mesos or, or Kubernetes. Uh, they're then going into an operational data store. In their, con in their context, that is Cassandra. Uh, and then they're doing two things. They're doing real-time predictions, which probably is a microservice architecture of some sort, Mesosphere, Kubernetes. Uh, or they're doing batch prediction, where again, they're leveraging Spark to do batch prediction at scale, distributed back batch prediction. They might be internal to Spark using a machine learning library like TensorFlow. Netflix has a very similar architecture for their product recommend, for their movie recommendation engine. It's pretty much honestly exactly the same thing. Kafka, Spark, you know, some machine learning algorithms, online prediction, online operational databases. Facebook is building a lot of its own stuff but it has a similar architecture. At the core, they have a core infrastructure, servers, compute, date, network. On top of that, they have their data platform, which includes workload management, uh, uh, deployment management, uh, machine learning productivity tool they call FB Learner. And on top of that, they have these open source machine learning frameworks or libraries. In their case, they're heavily invested in Cafe2, PyTorch, Onyx, okay? But you can think, put, put TensorFlow, TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn up there too. So the bottom line message that I wanna give is, these ecosystems, some people say, oh, you know, Kubernetes, you know, it's gonna kill Hadoop or something like that. These ecosystems really are trying to tackle different things and they can work together. So if you look at all of these stacks, it's really, how do we leverage compute? Kubernetes here is a, is a major now player, but the Hadoop components, Kafka, Spark, um, Hive, metadata security, et cetera, that's still a major, major part of the broader data platform. And then on top, it is being augmented by modern frameworks around innovative machine learning. So TensorFlow, PyTorch, that sort of uh, tooling. And a modern uh, ML stack, an enterprise ML stack, is really spans these two. 
Now, there are some hard choices, right? In the Hadoop ecosystem, we have Yarn, which is yet another resource manager. It's our resource manager behind some of the components here, uh, like uh, Spark and Hive. Um, you could run Spark potentially on Kubernetes. That might be a reasonable idea, right? So there's some areas where maybe you'll want to change things to take advantages of the different underlying resource management, but the frameworks on top really don't care about where they're running. And Tim will show you some of the stuff we're doing to run some of these frameworks where we think there's a benefit to running in containers natively on top of Kubernetes. All right. So the second uh, lesson that I want to uh, just mention is you really need to focus on the workflows for machine learning, not the frameworks. The frameworks are changing, and by frameworks and libraries, I mean things like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Spark, Ray, whatever your scikit-learn, or the languages, Python, R, Scala. Those are changing day by day. The rate of innovation is absolutely insane right now within the machine learning world. What you need to do is you need to, and data scientists want to use all of these tools, right? It's particularly within a large company. And so what you really need to do from a platform perspective is think about how do I enable the workflow underneath the, 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 behind the scenes? And from our perspective, there's a few key workflows that you need to help accelerate and help data scientists be more productive on. There's a development workflow, which is interactive. It's, you want it to behave like your laptop. You need access to data and compute, but you, hey, you want a mutate, mutatable file system, pip install a package. You want it to be like your laptop, like a development environment. You want a principled way to run training runs. So you want a way to snapshot your tra training code, submit something to the cluster, run it for a day or two, uh, do the training, compare the performance. So you need something around ad hoc training. You need something around sharing and collaboration, so you need something, some people like to share things. You know, for those in the R ecosystem, you might be familiar with Shiny, for instance. You definitely need data engineering, so you want a batch and pipeline system. That could include distributed jobs like Spark. And then, of course, you want to get to production and be able to run a model. So within, how do we do that on, so we do that within our machine learning product, Cloudera Machine Learning, running on top of Kubernetes. How does that actually work for, your, for, you, for you Kubernetes people? So Cloudera machine learning is built around enabling these workflows, and that's the abstraction that we try to target. So we have one, what's, you know, we have one operator, we kind of follow the operator pattern. We have four core CRDs. I put it in quotes because we don't actually use CRDs currently, but that's conceptually what they're doing. The first is for sessions. That's interactive and mutating. That's things like Jupyter Notebook, right? The interactive environment, development environment. Tim will show you some of that. We have an experiment which is how do we go from source to image to run, give you an immutable version that you can kick off and have a long living training run. We have a job, which is a scheduled recurring thing. And we have a model, which is an online, how do I deploy something as a RESTful microservice? One thing that I want to point out here, which I think is a little bit uh, potentially con controversial, is we do not have uh, long lived operators for any particular frame framework. So we do not have a TF job, we do not have a Spark job or anything like that. We try to let the frameworks just be libraries so that they can compose well into these higher level workflows, right? So you can have a Spark session, you can have a Spark experiment, a Spark job, a Spark model. And the, the libraries themselves, they can be Kubernetes aware, but we do not have a, a separate long-lived operator for every framework that our data scientists want to work, to use. And that's worked quite well for us. Um, it's definitely a topic worthy of questions if folks have that. The final thing is Kubernetes is not exposed to data scientists. Our goal is to really give them a serverless experience. And I love, you know, kubectl, but honestly, I can barely get some data scientists to, to love Git. Um, and so, you know, a wall of YAML that does all the Spark configuration is not what most higher level data scientists uh, want. So we've tried to build a system where you can get to Kubernetes if you absolutely need it, but for the end data scientists, we want that experience to be as serverless as possible. And what we mean by that is we want to have an experience, and we don't see why there's any reason why the platform can't provide an experience that's like, you know, Cloudera ML run, you know, Python train.py. You snapshot your code, you put it up, you build your image, install your dependencies, ship around your dependencies, run it, track the results, outputs, and it's done. And we likewise want the frameworks to have a similar, uh, uh, a serverless experience. So, and this is an example of Spark. We think you should just import Spark, import from PySpark, you know, SQL import Spark session, create a Spark session, ideally no configuration, and then run a, in this case, a distributed map over a function f, and that should spin up all the necessary compute resources. It should make sure that those compute resources have the dependencies that you've installed uh, in your environment, and all that should be ideally completely transparent to the user. 
And that's what we've been trying to enable. So there's some technology behind how do we, how do, we do this and how we're leveraging Spark. And I will turn it over to Tim, who will, can talk a little bit about some of the road ahead with respect to that. All right, thanks, Tristan. So let's move ahead and talk. So Tristan gave a great overview about the high-level lessons learned. Now I want to actually talk a little bit more uh, lower-level details about some of the technology we're using and how we're actually integrating and also show you what is Cloudera data science, uh, Cloudera machine learning, how does that look like running Spark on Kubernetes and actually running on managed Kubernetes overall. So we talked about Spark on Kubernetes and I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you all are with Spark and also Kubernetes. So maybe could, if you use Spark before, maybe show a uh, show of hands. OK, so it's maybe 20%. All right, so this is really interesting. How many of you actually tried Spark on Kubernetes yet? Oh, it's about the same. OK, so a little less. About, OK, I would say maybe 15, 20 people. All right, so if you use Spark on Kubernetes, you definitely understand what experience looks like. And so Spark on Kubernetes is great because it leverages Kubernetes, right? It has the Kubernetes. Uh, operations, things that you like about Kubernetes, like the affinities, you know, tolerations, all the things, you know, request limits, and everything you build tooling around Kubernetes, you can leverage it for Spark. So for us, Spark on Kubernetes is great because we can leverage our existing Kubernetes toolings and our frameworks and stuff we've built for Kubernetes and bring it in with Spark. What is most interesting, I think, here is we just talk about data scientists, they want to use various tools, right? They pip install a Python language, a package they like to use. This could be TensorFlow, this could be scikit-learn, it could be anything built themselves. And they use R, they use Scala, right? They use all kinds of languages. Right? So one problem, one challenge you, you probably will see is like, how do I actually ship these dependencies, you know, not just on a single session. When I run a Spark job, right, it's, it's distributed, it's gonna run containers in any one of the nodes in my Kubernetes cluster. How do I ship all these dependencies to a distributed uh, environment? And it, it makes it seamless, so the data scientists don't have to figure out, oh, I need to actually include some YAML files, and I go figure out all the things and build my own Docker images and stuff like that. How do I make it seamless? And this is interactive sessions. This is not like a pre-figured job and long-running batch jobs, right? Um, yeah, but Spark on Kubernetes, we talked about because you're running on Kubernetes, you know, you're running, you can use CPU, GPUs, and have auto-scaling capabilities in the cloud, and Overall, we're going to talk a little bit about how we actually improve utilization and multi-tenancy. But because we're bringing into the same resource manager, uh, we have a lot more opportunities to do that. All right, so very quick, Spark on Kubernetes has, so Spark used to have no native integration. Um, we brought it, and we means the whole community of Spark and a lot of Kubernetes people uh, helped along the way to get Spark have native integration. That means you don't have to actually care where's Kubernetes you actually configure in Spark, I want to use Kubernetes, and here's my Spark configuration. It will just talk to Kubernetes directly and run it. So you used to have standalone clusters, you know Spark. Now you can just run Spark directly pointing to Kubernetes API, and it will run executor pods for you. So I won't go into too much details, uh, but you can definitely see the documentation there. And what's great about it, as we talked about, is that if you have namespaces, quotas, RBACs built into your Kubernetes cluster, Spark can leverage that too. And I'll show you a little bit of that um, later. All right, so, so Spark on Kubernetes in Cloudera machine, uh, uh, machine learning, this is kind of how a little deeper dive of what it looks like, right? So in Cloudera machine learning, we have, uh, we have what we call engines. So an engine is basically where we are backing the sessions. It's kind of like a Jupyter notebook. When you create a Jupyter notebook, you have interactive session you can play with, right? So for every session you create, we create an engine. This engine is basically a Kubernetes pod with a container that has some of our pre-built dependencies that we think you, you'll need. And for us to use, so if you need a Spark interactive session, right, the only way to do it is through Spark client mode. And what client mode, if you're not familiar with Spark, Spark client mode means run the Spark main driver in that process directly, not running some driver on some other's pod or some other nodes, but you need to actually able to give it inputs and see the outputs in the same session, right? So you need to actually run that Spark driver in that session. And for us, how do we able to ship dependencies, right? If you pip install some arbitrary package and then just expect Spark to work, now how does that work? Well, for us, if you pip install, we set it up to make sure that you're pip installing into 
a network volume that we can able to ship around for you, right? So this could be NFS volume, it could be something else, but if you set it up the right way and you have a home directory and all the permissions set up for you, pip install into that, get your Spark executors to be able to manage your, all the necessary information to find those packages, right? So you can propagate that all around to different executors for you. So NSS volumes, you know, this is user permissions, and this is past setups and stuff like that. So we do it all for you behind the scenes. But one important piece of this is that um, for us to be able to propagate a lot of information from the main session to the executors, you need to able, um, we use something called uh, executor pod templates. So if you've been following the Spark on Kubernetes work, um, I need, you need, Instead of telling Spark, here's all the little details of what I need to propagate everywhere, give me a template, almost like a YAML file, but this is populated for you, that it can automatically uh, transfer anything in this pod template and put it into all the executors that I launch. So this could be labels, there could be volumes, there could be image pull secrets, it could be a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so because Kubernetes is adding a lot more fields in this YAML, it's really hard to add one one by one in Spark, because you imagine I had to create like hundreds of little knobs in Spark, and it's just almost impossible. So having a generic template you can pass around is, is actually a very powerful way for you to maintain a software like this. And an important part, piece of this is that because interactive sessions create executors, once you kill the session, everything is gone, right? The pod is gone, um, your session is gone. How do I find my logging? How do I find my Spark metrics? Right, for Spark History Server, how do I actually debug these things? So we set up FluentD um, and to point to these pods using like some uh, naming scheme and label that we can find these pods on this node, mounts the host volumes to give the share writing the logs, also the Spark metrics. Um, you need a little bit gluing because Spark metrics is a little bit interesting, um, but you need to actually be able to tail it out into the share volume. But this will be shipped to some external storage. So that's very quickly, you know, we don't have much time, but that's very quickly how we do this. And we, because we're using Kubernetes, we actually set up a namespace per project. So that's how every user don't just create whatever pod you want, right? We give you a, a quota, and we give you a service account that can only launch executors within your, your namespace. So you can go crazy in your namespace, you, know, you can kill your own executor pods, you can see each other's stuff, but you're never gonna be able to uh, see each other project's stuff and able to kill each other's pods, which oh, that would be horrible. Uh, there's, all, there's much more detail about Kerberos and all that stuff is happening. All right, so demo, I want to show you what this kind of looks like in our clutter machine learning, and I'll make sure it can come out. All right, so let me start bit here. So, okay, you probably see this. This is Cloudera and machine learning, how it looks like. It's a web interface. So data scientists will come in and log in, and every one of them has basically projects, right? A project is a shared workspace that has all your files there. You can collaboratively edit files and create interactive sessions from those projects. So normally you create a project. I already pre-created one. And you have your files. This is a, a PySpark template that we have. You can, um, there's a lot of things we can, we, there's sessions, experiments, there's model deployments and jobs and stuff like that. I wanna highlight today about Spark on Kubernetes. So if you open a workbench, a workbench is basically equivalent of a Drupal and Oprah we just talked about. You have an interactive session that you can launch here. So you can choose what engine you want. This engine, uh, we have our own engine that actually has a lot of dependencies like, you know, um, Anaconda or Scikit-Learn, all the default packages we think most data scientists need. And you can choose what language you want because that sets up all the language bindings and paths and stuff like that. And most interesting is that you can choose how much resources do you want to give this session. If you have GPUs in this cluster, it automatically detects it and it will show you what, how many GPUs do you want also for this session. You launch the session, this creates this interactive session for you, um, and you can, so, while this is running, let me explain to you what I would like to show you today. So how do you get dependency management? We talked about how we actually propagate dependencies across executors, right? And also how do we actually get Spark on Kubernetes to just work? Um, so this example is TensorFlow and Spark. So this is pre-trained models, but feeding uh, TensorFlow uh, some ImageNet images to do uh, inference. And I'm using Spark to just spread the images. 
right? So I have a bunch of images, I create RGDs in batches, I spread them around for executors, they all, they all pip installed TensorFlow, well, they don't actually do that. We, you pip install a TensorFlow in your session, it automatically propagates TensorFlow package to all the executors for you. So that in your executors, when you're doing the inference, it automatically picks up the TensorFlow dependency. So I pip install TensorFlow already. Um, it doesn't come with our default engine, but normally what you do is you do pip install TensorFlow here. Right? This installs only in your session, but um, I, let me just run this really quick. But what, do you what will happen here is basically it will start to download the image nets, download the images it needs to do inference on, and start to spread around the executors. So the most important piece here, okay, it's right here. Right, this is your typical PySpark code. I'm not sure this is too small. This is your typical PySpark code, right? This is what just Tristan just showed you, right? You just import PySpark, build a Spark session, and run it. And we will, in, in our engine, we, do, we have something called init process that's actually a propagate, a populates default configurations for your session. And we, we populate the Spark, Kubernetes, you know, where to find the API server, what the pod names are, you know, some, some default settings that this data scientist shouldn't even worry about. And we can talk about later about how even more advanced optimizations we can do if we know what you're running on. Right? Uh, so this is data science for them. They just import Spark and run it, right? Everything is already set up, and you know you it's, it just kind of just finishes. <laughs> uh, based on time, we can't really go through so much, but um, this basically goes through, spreads the images around, and run inference on them. So without the dependency management piece of mounting executors. Let me actually show you the pause. Hopefully, it's still running. Um, without actually mounting NFS pods uh, volumes into each executor, you won't be able to even run the example because this example needs custom packages to run. Um, this is probably a long time ago. All right. So, I have executors. This is Spark executors just launched for me for this my session that's running, right? So this is just happening behind the scenes. I have executors launched by Kubernetes, connected to this current client mode session, able to give out commands and get the output back and show you right here in this, your session right here. Right, so to the, to the data scientists, this is great. Right? I don't have to figure out how to actually configure Spark. I don't actually figure out how to do scale outs um, because this is kind of done for me. Of course, there's a lot more configuration parameters. And Spark is pretty, there's a lot more things you can tune, right? Um, so, there's, there's a way, we're gonna give you um, admin experiences, Spark history server, and all the tooling and logging you need to, to be able to see what's happening. But, so that's kind of how tens Spark on Kubernetes just natively integrates, right? So using a library, you can actually just run Spark on Kubernetes and actually get dependency management built in and, and also have namespaces, quotas, all of that set up. All right, so that's the demo. Um, you know, Two minutes. All right, so, so we're gonna go through this really quick. So what's what's happening right now? So um, there's there's more work needed on the Spark and Kubernetes upstream side, right? There's there's Kerberos support that's actually finishing in Spark uh, code base. Dynamic allocation doesn't work yet, and I'm not sure even know what dynamic allocation is. That means it's a, it's a auto scaling that's happening in a Spark level, right? Kubernetes has auto scaling, but you have to tell Kubernetes, hey, look at this metric. If it's above some threshold, start doing some scaling. Spark has a lot of information itself, right? I have a lot more tasks queued up. Please add more executors. So Spark can probably do a better job doing it. So this is what dynamic allocation does. And it is getting added to this Kubernetes native support. GPU support is you know, able to propagate information to Kubernetes for GPUs. You know, and what's the most interesting for, for us as well is that we have a lot of large scale use cases from Hadoop. What you need is also a much better batch scheduling when it comes to a, large, a certain stage, right? You, don't want, you want all your teams and organizations to be able to have a fair shares of your workloads and, and resources. So there's, in the six scheduling, there's queue batch that's happening, and definitely that is the right direction. Um, but I think most large scale use case in enterprises will need something like this to be able to actually support resource uh, management at scale for your batch jobs. All right, so really quickly, what's next, right? Um, talk about Spark on Kubernetes is just one big, one piece of getting your 
cloud native machine learning, uh, working on the Kubernetes. Coming from the hyperpilot world, this is also what I really firmly believe is that at scale, things are hard to tune, right? You have to tune your container resources, you have to tune your Spark resources, you have to tune your VM, cluster size, instance types, all kinds of stuff. So we really believe that, and this is just machine learning, right? If you actually start to actually cram in data warehousing, data engineering, right, in this shared environments, how do you, it's almost impossible for data engineers and admin to really tune everything uh, that has your best case utilization, right? And I think increasingly we're seeing actually our customers are talking about utilization, talking about how cost is affecting them right, at scale as well. So how do we actually use the data from your cluster, able to analyze and optimize and automatically manage your clusters, right? This is not just telling you what you should be doing. Can we actually create automation for you? Um, so this is bringing some of the hyperpilots um, uh, screenshots, but this is what we're also we're looking to actually embed into uh, Caldera's uh, future offerings in some points. But uh, using data, you can really able to figure out a lot more insights, right? Rather than just telling, rather just telling your data engineers, hey, your container is CP, uh, rather just seeing CPU spiked at 80%, and rather just seeing that, hey, my memory has been using at 60%, I got wound killed. You know, can we actually tell you what really happened? You know, what, what is a key resource bottleneck? Because if you have to look at your monitoring dashboard, it's really hard to figure out. If networking is high, CPU is high as well, right? If, it's, if IO is high, in, in the cloud environments, you actually your CPU might be high too, right? Because you have a shared volume. Uh, actually, IO is high, networking might be high as well. You have network volumes attached, right? Really hard to figure out what is a key resource bottlenecks and what the key problems are happening. And is it interference? Am I, am I getting actually overtaken by another container running on the same node or cluster? So we did a lot of work to use machine learning to actually figure out what the insights and figure out the root causes. So this is one screenshot there. I want to quickly mention the last thing is just showing you what to be done, what is a key problem, doesn't really automatically solve and give you the best utilization, right? To get the best utilization possible, you really need to have automation. And what we talk about automation is not just adding more nodes, it's not just adding more pods. You know, in this particular example, um, if, you, if you're interested, you definitely should look for, search for hyperpilots and um, you can definitely see a lot more details. We, we've seen a lot of use cases where there's interference happening on the same node. If I have a pod running a lot of network traffic and overtaking another long running service, and in a machine learning context, this is a model deployment that's running next to your Spark job doing batch job training. So how do I, if you don't want to waste a lot of resources and pre-allocate your largest cluster to do model deployments, you want to be able to utilize your Slack resources to do model training. But it's a real challenge to not interfere with the deployments that are doing inference on real time. So in this screen, this is probably a little bit hard to digest, but this is saying that this is what long-running services, what happens when you run a batch job next to your long-running services is basically your latency it spikes up. Because this is running Spark jobs or doing, you know, terror sorts and doing a lot of different, it's doing a lot of network traffic to pull data in from S3, doing a lot of shuffle data, writing it to your I.O. and disks, and you see a lot of interference are happening. You could, enable automation on a node level as well, right? If you imagine your resources are not just only static the whole time it's running, but able to actually figure out what is a key resource bottlenecks. We're talking about IO level, network level, CPU, memory, and, and even lower levels things, and automate it. Because you're, if we understand your batch job, it doesn't have to finish right the next minute. You don't really need to take all the resources you're, you're looking for and only give you certain resources that required at, the, at real time then I can able to really achieve much higher utilization. So your utilization can jump much higher without really killing your jobs, batch jobs. So that's the next kind of level of automation we want to enable for um, Kubernetes. So that's it. Um, all the stuff we talked about, like Spark on um, Caldera Machine Learning, you can feel free to come up and sign up. We have a private preview coming up. You um, can go to the URL and, and actually try out and give us feedback early. This runs on all Kubernetes, uh, managed Kubernetes. Um, and um, yeah, there's also relevant six 
that we just talked about scheduling, big data. There's a machine learning working group that also recently formed that we're also going to be engaging and talking about a little bit about a lot more things like this. I think that's it. Um, welcome any questions and anything.